Sergei Diaghilev personally played a key role in the early development of the fantastical story set at the Shrovetide Fair in St. Petersburg around 1830, in which the puppet Petrushka, who comes to life with two other puppets as beings, is a symbol of repression and victimization. And as a team that worked brilliantly together, albeit with quite a lot of differences between them, composer Igor Stravinsky, choreographer Mikhail Fokin, and stage designer Alexandre Benoit devised a macabre and often disturbing scenario of extraordinary ingenuity. A large crowd has come to see a puppet show put on by a charlatan. He shows them three puppets, Petrushka, a ballerina and a blackamoor. And through magic, he brings them to life for a dance. That's his show. But then the action goes backstage and the puppets' real lives as beings come into play. Petrushka is a tortured soul. He's been made by the charlatan to look a ridiculous and pathetic figure, gauche, nervous and clumsy. And as the charlatan kicks him into his cell, we see him like a caged, trapped animal. He's in love with the ballerina, but she ignores him as she only has eyes for the garish and macko blackamoor. Finally, there's a violent fight and the blackamoor kills Petrushka in front of the crowd, but the charlatan calms them by showing them that he is only a sawdust puppet. But then, after the crowd has dispersed in the deserted fairground at the dead of night, Petrushka's ghost appears, shaking his fist at the charlatan, and he runs away terrified. This was an unprecedented kind of subject for a ballet, and it inspired Stravinsky to write an unprecedented kind of musical score sometimes magical, sometimes sinister, sometimes macabre, and sometimes grotesque. As well as including some old Russian folk tunes, and also at one point a French music hall tune, Petrushka was full of strange, exotic harmonies and sonorities, as well as many highly irregular rhythms and meters. All very, very new for the dancers, the orchestra under the expert direction of Pierre Monteux and the audience when it premiered at the Châtelet Theatre in Paris on June the 13th, 1911. Petrushka is the real turning point, both musically and choreographically and from every, every other point of view. Until then, in France, certainly, the ballet music had been regular in, in, in its rhythms. I mean, it had been four-bar phrases, four lots of four-bar phrases, and there you were. Uh, and immediately, and now we're into something quite different. Nothing is balanced. There are five beats in a bar, seven beats in a bar. And you have somehow to accommodate that to a, a new technique of dancing. And it's new in texture, too. It's a new hardness and brittleness yeah. about it. It's, it's miles away from Firebird, which retains the lushness and the sparkle of Rimsky-Korsakov. I mean, there's no question about it. What you see is what you get in the Petrushka score. Petrushka also brought new kinds of people onto the ballet stage. It brings the crowd in, and, and this is not a posh crowd, this is not the ball, this is the Butter Week Fair, which had been abandoned in Russia. And so for all these Russians, it was nostalgia to see something that they'd seen in their youth. Karsavina says she had always loved the Butter Week Fair when she'd been a girl, um, but it had been abandoned in the early 1900s, and here it was again. And this was a plebeian crowd, just an ordinary crowd, nothing extraordinary about them.
one of the things that makes Stravinsky's Petrushka extraordinary is the way it moves in a very powerful modernist direction, that it uses themes that may be associated with particular characters or particular types from this nostalgic Russian world, because it's not a contemporary Russian fair. It's a Russian fair from the 1830s. Um, So it's already almost 100 years old, the world that's being um, suggested. But it also combines it with this extraordinary, almost nervous energy that is very early 20th century and a kind of impressionism so that you hear things happening before you actually see them. And here, in the second scene, we're in Petrushka's tiny cell, where there's a picture on the wall of the charlatan scowling at him. The stage instructions say, Maledictions of Petrushka. The ballerina enters. The ballerina leaves. Petrushka's despair. Taking the title role of Petrushka on stage and dancing it with vivid and brilliant virtuosity in a kind of choreography that was very new for the world of ballet was Václav Nijinsky. I think it's interesting what Benoit says about Petrushka's part. He said the great difficulty of Petrushka's part, of the dancing that is to say, is to express his pitiful oppression and his hopeless efforts to achieve personal dignity without ceasing to be a puppet. You have to have the personality, you have to have the life, and at the same time, not be alive. And somehow, Nijinsky managed to combine those two.
It was most of all the novelty and power of Stravinsky's music that was now pushing the demands and the entire concepts of dance into new kinds of character areas. For the first time in the history of ballet, the composer was leading the way. One of the enormous legacies of Diaghilev is precisely in music. Within almost no time at all, he completely destroyed the edifice of music making in 19th century ballet, which depended upon the specialist composer. That is to say, a composer who would cobble together something for the specifics of the choreographer. This happened at the Mariinsky, where it's very, very well documented, Petipa's relationship with Minkus and Pugni and even Tchaikovsky, where he would say, I want so many measures and I want so many bars and I want it to sound like this and this should be sprightly and this should be a waltz and this should be in 6-8 tempo etc., etc. But this, even though there was a very close collaboration between Alexandre Benoit and uh, Stravinsky with Petrushka, nevertheless, the music has an independent life, which is why we love to hear it as well. We don't necessarily need to see it in order to appreciate the music. Sergei Diaghilev's Ballet Russe was flying through the artistic world like a comet. The year after Petrushka came the premiere of another work that was to be acclaimed as a great musical masterpiece of the 20th century. But it could not have been more completely different from Petrushka. Each and every new Diaghilev commission was wholly individual in its own way. And for Daphne C. Chloe, to be choreographed by Mikhail Fokin, Diaghilev engaged Maurice Ravel to write an orchestral score on a massive scale. <laughs> 